a pretty disturbing case in which the value that a person possesses due to their fame and their talent makes them uniquely vulnerable to outside influences trying to control them and exploit them. Well, hello there, everybody. My name is Kristen, and this is my YouTube channel. Welcome. Last week, I talked about Megan Fox and the way that her aesthetic allowed for her to be stereotyped, pigeonholed, and in many ways, limited. The week before that, I talked about Paris Hilton and the way her new documentary almost accidentally became very effective due to her decision to be vulnerable in the documentary. And today, I'm going to be talking about Britney Spears, her conservatorship, more on what that is later, and the way that her extreme bankability possibly made her very vulnerable to potential exploitation throughout her life. So let's get started. Britney Spears' first taste of the entertainment industry came at the young age of eight, when she auditioned for the Mickey Mouse Club. She was not accepted in this first round of auditioning because she was too young. However, the audition was not for nothing because it was at this audition where she and her mother met Nancy Carson, who would encourage them to move to New York and get Brittany enrolled in a professional performing arts school. This school facilitated her getting some early work, including appearing in a musical, appearing on Star Search, and having roles in various commercials. Her Star Search appearance really showcased the quality of her voice even at such a young age. Don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's time? When we stand together, it's our finest hour. We can do anything, oh, anything. Keep believing. Her voice was very well projected and sounded very mature. If you were not looking at the child singing at the time, you would have thought it was a fully grown woman on that stage. In 1992, she auditioned for the Mickey Mouse Club again, this time achieving success. She appeared on the show alongside other child actors, including Justin Timberlake, Ryan Gosling, and Christina Aguilera. After the show was canceled, she went back to her normal life for a short time but in 1997 began working with producer Eric Foster White. Eric Foster White worked with her to train her voice to be more youthful and pop-esque. He worked with her to develop a bit of a nasally quality that made her sound younger and more poppy and served to differentiate her voice from another upcoming star, Christina Aguilera. This more girlish, almost baby voice is the voice that you are used to hearing from Britney Spears. It's what you'll hear on the majority of her studio albums, as well as in her live performances. Although you can find examples of live performances where it seems like she's slipping a little bit in between her natural voice and this more breathy, nasally baby voice. <laughs> Something to note is that singing in this breathy way, over time, if you're not careful and you're not warming up your voice properly and you're not, if you're not, if you're singing too loudly, it can, it can really damage your voice. People have speculated that this happened to Britney by, you know, listening to her singing later in her life as an adult and comparing that to her when she was younger. It's hard to say if this type of singing really is what damaged her voice because when people get older and they have kids, their voices change anyway. So it's really hard to say though. So in 1999, at the age of 17, Britney released her debut album, Baby One More Time, which was recorded when she was 16, which is really just wild for me to think about doing something like that so young. The album debuted at number one, as well as the single Baby One More Time. The album sold 121,000 copies in the first week. 
She was the first new artist, male or female, to have a single debut at number one the same week that her album debuted at number one. She's also the youngest female in Billboard history to have an album and a single debut at number one. The album spent six non-consecutive weeks at number one on the Billboard Top 200, and it sold 1.8 million copies in the first two months. By week 47, it was still at number three on the Billboard 200, and it had sold over 10 million copies in the United States alone. This album made Spears the youngest artist to receive a diamond certification from the Recording Industry Association of America. In total, the album spent 101 weeks on the Billboard chart, so almost two years. The tour for this album brought in $53 million, that's adjusted for 2020 value of money, and it brought in 1.2 million attendees. As can be seen, her first album was incredibly successful. It really blew people out of the water. Now, at the same time that this album was released, at age 17, she also appeared on the cover of Rolling Stone wearing um, essentially a bra and like boy short cut panties. It was considered to be inappropriate and highly sexual and, in my opinion, it's a bit of a harbinger for what was to come for Britney in her career in terms of being objectified and exploited for profit. Her next album, Oops, I Did It Again, came out in 2000, and it was another rousing success. It sold 500,000 copies on day one, debuted at number one again, and by the end of the first week had sold 1.3 million copies. This actually set a record that Britney would hold for the next 15 years for the most sales in the first week of an album's release. It was certified septuple platinum by the 17th week on the Billboard chart because it had sold 7 million copies. Needless to say, her second album was another rousing success. Needless to say, her second album was another wild success. The tour, which this time went from North America to Europe and South America, as opposed to only being in North America, brought in $63 million and 1.5 million attendees. Her third album, Britney, came out in 2001 and, like the first two, debuted at number one and was another huge success. The tour for this album was her most profitable yet, bringing in $80 million and 1.2 million attendees. This album made her the first female artist to have her first three albums debut at number one. In 2003, her fourth studio album, In the Zone, was released, and again, it was a wild success. It debuted at number one. This time, Britney actually co-wrote a lot of the songs and co-produced the album, so she had more creative control than her previous albums. It was certified double platinum, and she won a Grammy for the song Toxic, which was on the album. This album netted another lucrative tour, bringing in $48 million and 600,000 attendees. You might notice that these numbers are a little lower than the previous three albums. And I looked into it and I saw that this tour was actually about half the length of the other three tours. So that kind of explains why it brought in around half the money and half the attendance. It was shorter. Her next album, Blackout, would be the first studio album to not debut at number one. There was actually a bit of a kerfuffle. She originally did debut at number one because the other album that would actually overtake her was only sold in Walmart stores and at the time Billboard had a rule that if an album was only sold in one store it wasn't eligible for some reason but like I said there was a whole kerfuffle and ultimately Billboard changed the rules so Britney's album was officially set to be number two because of that but it easily could have been number one had Billboard not changed their rules. So Blackout, like I said, debuted at number one. It came out in 2007, and its release coincided with um, an increase in public incidences and struggles that Britney began getting involved in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those now. These public incidences began in 2006 with Britney being photographed driving with her baby in her lap, which is not safe. So there was a lot of concern around that photo. She was also seen walking, carrying her baby in coffee, almost dropping her baby, but not the coffee. 
she didn't drop the baby, but again, almost dropping. And then in November 2006, things really got crazy when she filed for divorce against her then husband and the father of her child, children, Kevin Federline. This, um, this filing for divorce prompted a few months of partying um, that was very publicly documented. She was seen out with Paris Hilton primarily, um, video on her a few weeks ago, actually. And there were many concerning photographs captured where she just seemed very inebriated, unwell. Um, there were a lot of pictures captured of her not wearing underwear. People joked that photographers even captured her cesarean scar from her C-section. So it was a rough few months for Brittany after filing for divorce and just, I guess, you know, trying to party and maybe get out of her head a little bit, but she was facing a lot of public criticism and scrutiny at the time. She checked in and out of rehab multiple times in 2007. 2007 was also the year that she shaved her head. You probably have heard about that incident. The source who's, you know, kind of hard to verify, it was some guy who claims he did her tattoo for her after she shaved her head. He said that she shaved her head because she was tired of people touching her hair, which seems like, you know, if it's true, it seems like someone who's trying to recapture a little bit of control, which makes sense considering the way her life had been pretty run by management companies and under the spotlight, you know, ever since she was 16. 2007 was also the year of a pretty fierce custody battle between her and Kevin Federline. At one point when they had 50-50 custody, Brittany took her children out of state, which was against the custody agreement. And um, I think could be considered kidnapping if you take a child across state lines without, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm, so that was bad. She was also involved in a hit and run where she hit a parked car while driving without a license. She did compensate the owner of the car and later the judge ended up not charging her because she had already paid for the damage, but it was still pretty concerning. And even after this court appearance, she continued to drive with her children in the car without a license, which is not cool. On October 1st of 2007, a judge ordered her to give the kids to Kevin Federline, at least temporarily, and he was granted full custody a few days later. During that month, she kind of gained and lost visitation rights multiple times. It was pretty up and down for her. And it was at the end of this month, October, when she lost her kids that the album Blackout was released. So knowing that she was going through all of this public turmoil for really the year leading up to the release of the album and then the year of the album's release, it's actually really impressive that it performed as well as it did, debuting at number two, considering her public image was really being damaged by a lot of these incidents because, you know, who doesn't want kids to be safe and who doesn't dislike hit and run drivers, right? There were more public incidents after the album came out and child welfare even got involved and conducted investigations into her parenting. Throughout this time, the celebrity news industry really fixated on Britney Spears because she became very profitable. Phot photographing Britney Spears became a veritable industry in and of itself. Francois Navarre, founder of X17, a paparazzi, company or something is quoted in 2008 as saying that Britney Spears is the most bankable celebrity out there. She has been for the past year. In 2007, she was on two thirds of the cover of Us Weekly publications. Francois Navarre reported that a photo of Britney without residuals could sell for $10,000. And with residuals, a unique photo of her could net a photographer $100,000 over time. So it was, it was a very valuable industry. Paparazzi parked outside her house day and night, just waiting for a car to leave that they could follow. Every single, you know, celebrity news organization and paparazzi organization, they had people on the clock. Their job was to watch Britney and report her every move so that they could get a photo of her. And once you had a photo, 
speed was the most important thing because you wanted to get it released. You wanted to get paid for it before anyone else could. So this created a very, very scary situation where mobs of people would be just surrounding her vehicles and following her everywhere she goes and taking photos of everything that she did. Things with the paparazzi were so bad that even when she was being hospitalized, being taken to a psychiatric hospital in an ambulance, even then they surrounded the ambulance and photographed her being put in the ambulance and followed the ambulance to the hospital and followed Kevin Federline to the hospital and got all of this on photos. Online, there are photos of Brittany smiling at EMTs as they have her on the stretcher and they're putting her into the ambulance. I can't even imagine having my privacy violated in such a scary moment like that when I'm being hospitalized and I still have these mobs of people treating me like I'm not even human. Like, that's crazy. So that first hospitalization I mentioned occurred in early January 2008. She would be hospitalized again in that same month. And after the second hospitalization, both of which were what are called 5150s, which is basically when a mental health care professional has deemed that you are a possible danger to yourself or others and they need to put you under psychiatric hold. So she had two 5150s in one month. And at that point, a her father went to a judge and petitioned to be named the temporary conservator of her estate. And so this was the creation of what is called the conservatorship or in some states it's called a guardianship. It was originally intended to be temporary, but at the end of 2008, it was made permanent. Conservatorships or guardianships are usually for the elderly, people who are experiencing something debilitating like dementia, or for people with developmental disabilities that prevent their ability to care for themselves. And that's not physical care, it's more things like being able to make good decisions, you know, keep your lights on, keep your bills paid, decide what jobs to take, things like that. So it's really designed for people who their mental capacity is just not there and they need somebody to help them and to make sure that they are safe. And so like you might've heard me saying, it's for people with, like I said, like dementia or a developmental disability and so to justify making this conservatorship permanent, they claimed that Brittany had early onset dementia in her 20s. And that was believed by the judge and taken as a reason to make her conservatorship permanent. Under the conservatorship, her father has pretty tight control over every aspect of her life. Among his Duties for this conservatorship are negotiating business deals, deciding who she can see, filing restraining orders on her behalf, tracking every purchase she makes, no matter how big or small, and more. A co-conservator, Andrew Wallet, was brought on to manage the financial aspects of her estate, and he remained on the conservatorship with her father through 2019. Without her father's permission, Brittany, under this conservatorship, could not leave her house, vote, buy anything, have any interviews that are not scripted, speak to anyone without being monitored, view her bank statements, get married, have kids, see her kids, drive, which Maybe she shouldn't do, honestly. She can't use her phone without monitoring. And I think most importantly, she could not hire a lawyer to represent herself. If she were to do anything, any of the thing, if Brittany were to do any of the things I just listed without her father's permission, he would have the full right to institutionalize her in a psychiatric facility. So he has enforcement power over her if, if she were to step out of line, there's a very easy consequence of, I'm going to send you to the psychiatric hospital. So it's a little bit scary that somebody could have that kind of power over another adult who, as far as we can tell, doesn't 
seem to have dementia or any other developmental disabilities. It's highly unusual for someone who is as productive as Britney Spears to be under a conservatorship. Just two months after the hospitalization that prompted the creation of the conservatorship, she filmed a guest appearance for How I Met Your Mother. Four months after that filming, she released the video for Womanizer and promotion of her new album, Circus, which was also released. Circus, like most of her other studio albums, debuted at number one, and it had a very successful tour. It was around an eight-month tour, and it brought in $198 million and 1.5 million attendees. So that's more than any previous tour. Conservatorships are supposed to be for people who are severely disabled that will not get better. Isn't it odd for someone who's severely disabled to the point that they can't make decisions for themselves in any way? Isn't it odd for someone like that to be able to perform at such a high level under such pressure and stress? You know, it's no secret that touring is one of the hardest things that any musician will do. And yet, a, an apparently severely disabled woman suffering early onset dementia was able to go on an eighth month tour, learn all the choreography for every single song, know every word for every song, and perform at such a high level that it outperformed any previous tour she'd done. Something doesn't make sense. Since the issuing of the conservatorship, She's released four studio albums, including Circus, which I've already mentioned. She's done three world tours, which were successful, as all of her tours seem to be. She's released product lines, including lingerie and perfume lines that were pretty successful. And she had a 40 year Las Vegas residency. And she was also a main judge in the X Factor. She has According to, you know, it's hard to say when you Google how much somebody makes, if it's accurate, but according to my research, she has brought in over $100 million a year since the institution of the conservatorship. So for the average person, for most people, a year or two of erratic behavior like what we've seen of Brittany, which was again, bad driving, drinking a lot, you know, going to rehab, not necessarily wearing underwear, and then having, you know, some public emotional breakdowns. For any average person, you know, someone like me or you, assuming you're an average person watching, a few years of behavior like that would just kind of be maybe embarrassing. It might threaten our employment. It might cause problems in our social relationships. And it might, you know, have negative financial consequences for us, but it would not result in one of our parents being made our permanent guardian with control over every single aspect of our lives for what seems to be the rest of our lives. You know, if, if somebody, an average person were to go on a one to two year bender and break the law a few times, they would probably end up in jail. They would not lose their right to leave their house, buy a coffee, see their children, have more children, get married, speak to a friend without explicit permission and monitoring, use the phone without monitoring, vote, hire a lawyer, view the bank, view your own bank account. You know, those are some pretty extreme restrictions to place on somebody who appears to have had like I said, a few bad years, which if you consider the public pressure that she was under, the public scrutiny, and just the intense harassment she was receiving from the paparazzi, in addition to the fact that she was going through a divorce with her husband that she had two children with, it kind of makes sense that she was behaving erratically. Like it, it makes sense that she wasn't doing very well between 2006 and 2008. It doesn't seem like someone who is severely disabled so much as it was someone who was going through a very, very hard time. So what makes Brittany different? Why did Brittany have pretty much all of her rights and freedoms restricted after two-ish years of erratic behavior? 
when most people would not experience something like that? What makes, what differentiates her from the average person? Well, if you were wondering why I took the time to tell you how much money her tours made, how many copies her albums sold, how many of her albums debuted at number one and more, well, this is, this is why I brought that up because I don't know how to, how to phrase this. Um, as far as I can tell, any situation like this one where you have a very famous, very valuable star who consistently makes very profitable albums and profitable tours, when you have someone of that level of bankability and they're behaving in a way that could jeopardize that profit that is there to be made, there might be an incentive to try to reach in and grab control to preserve the financial benefits that come with being connected to somebody with that level of fame and success. You know, when you consider just the number of people who get their livelihoods off of celebrities, the number of staff that celebrities employ, the paparazzi that make their living off following celebrities, the producers, the musician, the, the music producers who work with the celebrities to make their albums, and the family members who act as management for these celebrities, you know, there's a lot of money that's being made and there's a lot of livelihoods that are on the line with someone like this. And so it seems possible that while somebody might not be disabled to the extent that they truly need to be in a conservatorship, the amount of money at stake could possibly motivate the institution of a conservatorship anyway. So to me and to many others, um, including the people who call themselves the free Britney movement, this really seems like one of the situations I just described. It seems like it could possibly be a pretty disturbing case in which the value that a person possesses due to their fame and their talent makes them uniquely vulnerable to outside influences trying to control them and exploit them. So just as an example for how lucrative this conservatorship has been, Brittany's father every year of the conservatorship received a salary from her of over $100,000. I think it was like $130,000 as well as percentages of the revenue from her business engagements, such as the Las Vegas residency. So this conservatorship has been very profitable for the conservators. The president of the National Association to Stop Guardian Abuse, Elaine Renoir, is quoted as saying, as long as Brittany keeps bringing in so much money, as long as the conservators and lawyers are getting paid, there is very little incentive for it to end. Usually conservatorship keeps going until the conservatee or the family make a fuss. So even public figures who speak out for organizations against guardian abuse seem to acknowledge the monetary incentive to keep the conservatorship in place. Brittany's brother went on a podcast in this year, 2020, and he said that Brittany has always wanted out of the conservatorship and that she's found it frustrating, which makes sense. Uh, he said that, you know, even if in the very beginning stages it might have been necessary, um, it didn't need to continue as long as it has. Brittany herself is quoted back in, I want to say 2008, as saying, like, even when you go to jail, you know, there's the time when you're going to get out. But in this situation, it's never ending. It's just like the movie Groundhog Day. But I just feel like, you know, you do something wrong and you learn from it, you move on, but it's like I'm having to pay for it for a really long time. <laughs> 
So that's kind of sad. If Brittany were to want out of the conservatorship, what would she have to do? You know, if, if she wants out the way her brother claims that she has wanted out, what has to be done? Well, Sam Crane, the legal and public policy director of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, a nationally recognized expert on alternatives to guardianship, has said that you need to go to court and establish that conservatorship isn't necessary anymore. But because you haven't recently had the opportunity to make decisions for yourself, it's extremely difficult to pr prove to a judge that you can make these decisions. Because people under conservatorship don't have access to their own money, it can be difficult or impossible for them to hire a lawyer to help with this. And even with the support of the conservator, it can take years for somebody to get out of a conservatorship. And in most cases, the conservatorship doesn't end. People stay in it until they die. So what are the most recent developments with Britney's conservatorship? So in I will run through that. So in 2019, Brittany's father requested to step down as the conservator temporarily. And he stated that the reason for this was that he had health issues that he needed to focus on. Something else that also happened in 2019, a little bit before he made this request, was that um, a police report was filed by Kevin Federline against Brittany's father. And in the police report, it's alleged that he got in a fight, an argument with one of Brittany's children, and the child got scared and ran away and ran upstairs into a bedroom. And according to the police report, he knocked down the door of the bedroom and grabbed the kid and was like violently shaking the child. So after that police report was filed, Kevin Federline was granted a restraining order against Brittany's father for his two children. And then after this is when Brittany's father told the judge that he had some health issues that meant he needed to temporarily step down for the conservatorship. So, you know, did he step down because of health issues? That's what he says. Did he step down because of what happened with Brittany's children? I don't know. The timing is there, so it's just a question. Um, so yeah, and so when he when he requested to be you know temporarily set down, he asked the judge to declare Jody Montgomery, who is Brittany's long term care manager. I don't really know what that means, but that means she was on staff with them. To, to be the temporary conservator. So since 2019, Jody Montgomery has been the temporary conservator. Also in 2019, Andrew Wallet, the, the co-conservator who was managing the financials, stepped down. So this year in 2020, Brittany petitioned the court to make Jody Montgomery the permanent conservator of her estate um, in lieu of her father being able to return as permanent conservator. In the documents released, to the public from the court hearing is revealed that she's strongly opposed to her father returning as a conservator and that she would prefer Jody Montgomery continue in the role. In addition to not wanting her father to return as permanent conservator, she stated that she did not want Andrew Wallet to return either. Her father had petitioned the court to bring Andrew Wallet back in as a co-conservator um, and Brady made it clear that she did not want that. On the court documents, it stated that without in any way waiving her right to seek termination of the conservatorship in the future, she strongly prefers to have a qualified corporate fiduciary appointed to serve this role. And so she and her lawyer had found, you know, a financial management company that they wanted to work with and they're trying to get someone from there on as another co-conservator instead of Andrew Wallet. In the court documents, it says that Brittany right now doesn't have plans to resume performing and thus wouldn't really be, she wouldn't really be bringing in enough money to pay Andrew Wallet. Um, and it also stated that he was uniquely unsuitable for the role. So that indicates some level of tension maybe or problems between him and Brittany. I don't know. I 
can only speculate, so. But so, and that's something to note that that's something to note that Britney has said that she doesn't right now want to perform. In October of 2020, in the most recent court proceeding as of today when I'm making this video, Britney requested and was granted the ability to expand her legal team and hire her own lawyers. This was in spite of her father's efforts to block this move. Um, it's hard to say why exactly he doesn't want Brittany to hire her own lawyers, but I don't know. You can, you can guess as to why he doesn't want her to hire her own lawyers. Um, he claims that lawyers are too expensive, but conservatorships are really expensive too, so I don't know. The court documents state that Brittany does not share her father's vision for a future in which she resumes performing and leaves the management of her estate completely up to him as she did in the past. So Brittany is seeking to gain a little bit more control back in her life. And it seems like her father does not want that to happen because he's made every effort in court to stop that from happening. During this court proceeding, they were also supposed to go over some financial documents that Brittany's father submitted, but Brittany's lawyer stated that he had not had time to finish going over the documents um, and that he did plan to file objections in relation to some of the items in the documents. So they'll be going over that in the next court appearance, which I believe is in November. During this court proceeding, her father petitioned to have the records sealed. I wonder why he wouldn't want anybody to know what was going on. But um, Brittany's representation made it very clear that she did not want the records to be sealed. The, the court documents say that Brittany strongly believes it is in her Brittany strongly believes it is consistent not only with her personal best interests, but also with good pu public policy generally, that the decision to appoint a new conservator of her estate be made in as open and transparent manner as possible. The sealing motion is supposedly being brought by her father to protect Brittany's interests, but she is adamantly opposed to it. The court documents go on to say that Brittany is vehemently opposed to the effort that her father has made to keep her legal struggle hidden away in a closet as a family secret. And the documents state that the moment James obtained from this court the power to handle Brittany's affairs on her behalf, he surrendered a large measure of privacy as to the manner in which he exercises that power. Transparency is an essential component in order for the court to earn and retain the public's confidence with respect to protective proceedings like this one. In this case, it is not an exaggeration to say that the whole world is watching. So also in this court proceeding, multiple times, Brittany's father and his lawyers were saying stuff like, where's Brittany? We want Brittany to speak for herself. We want to hear from Brittany. Um, over and over again, and Brittany's representation pretty much maintained that, like, in addition to the fact that, you know, Brittany doesn't have to be here because that's what the lawyer's for, but according to the conservatorship that the father supports, Brittany is not legally capable to speak for herself in the court of law. So why do they want her to speak for herself? And her lawyer said something to the effect of, like, you know, it's very transparent what they're trying to do here, getting Brittany to speak for herself, and we're not gonna let it happen. So it seems like there is some level of conflict and tension going back and forth between Brittany's father and Brittany's own representation. So, yeah. Like I said, during this court proceeding, Brittany was granted her request to hire her own legal counsel and expand her legal team. So if, what her brother has said is true, that she's always wanted out of the conservatorship, these steps of requesting that Jody Montgomery be made the permanent conservator and being allowed to hire her own legal counsel will get her a little bit closer to, if not ending the conservatorship, loosening the reins that the conservatorship has over her. Because Jody Montgomery appears to have allowed Brittany to hire a lawyer to represent her in this court. 
when her father would not necessarily have done that, it seems, because he didn't in the 12 years that he was her conservator. So it seems like Brittany is taking baby steps to gaining a little bit more autonomy, um, even if she's not necessarily seeking to terminate the conservatorship tomorrow, she's taking steps to gain more control, which is good. The next court proceeding is November 10th, and it's during this session that the objections that her representation have on the financial documents will be heard, and um, a decision regarding whether he can return as the permanent conservator will also come sometime in the future. For now, Jody Montgomery is still the temporary conservator. A judge, I want to say in August, granted an extension of her temporary conservatorship. So we'll see if a judge grants the transfer of the conservatorship over to her permanently or not. While Brittany's conservatorship is very unique in the ways that it was highly, you know, profitable and possibly motivated financially due to her success as a pop star. This conservatorship is just really a public example of something that happens to Americans every day. We don't have exact numbers because for some reason we don't keep records of it, but AARP has estimated that around 1.3 million Americans were in conservatorships as of 2013. So that number has probably only grown. While much of the time, these conservatorships function as intended, there is very little court oversight into conservatorships. Conservators are required to submit records of everything they do in regards to the conservatorship and all the money that's spent, but most courts don't have the funding to pay someone to actually review those records. And some courts don't even have enough judges. So this inability to really oversee and keep people accountable leaves a lot of room for abuse. There have been countless incidences of financial abuse and guardianships where people's entire estate is just gone. A conservator can charge you for literally anything. There was one case that I remember reading about where a woman who had had a stroke, you know, was no longer able to take care of herself and she had been very wealthy and a conservatorship was instituted and the conservator charged her for everything, you know, like even like $50 to open an envelope, you know, crazy charges like that. And within a few years, her money was all gone because the conservator had found ways to charge her for all kinds of stuff and drain her bank account. And that's just one example. Um, there's some others where conservators sold people's property without consulting them and euthanized their pets, you know, examples where families get in legal battles over conservatorship because their elderly parents have dementia and every kid wants to have control over the money. Um, apparently it can be even more intense than divorce proceedings and child custody proceedings. And it's, you know, even, even if someone's not a pop star like Brittany, if someone has a significant amount of money, and they are facing potential disability, such as due to dementia or risk of stroke, um, they can be very vulnerable to exploitation by younger family members who want control of their finances. In cases of financial abuse within guardianships, there is very little recourse for victims. Bernard A. Crooks, um, a lawyer and the founding partner of his law firm, has is stated saying, the system is underfunded. There's not enough judges who understand what to do and how to do it. There's not enough volunteers to do the work and there's not enough money to pay people to do it on a compensatory basis. He indicates, I think like I've already said that courts do not often have money for staff to oversee guardians and review the documents that they submit to the court. A shortage of judges to handle Cases of all kinds, including guardianship, can exacerbate problems. And Bernard, Bernard A. Crooks is quoted saying that you're dealing with the most vulnerable segment of the population, including elderly and people who cannot stand up for themselves. 
So you've just got a recipe for disaster, and that's what's happening in a lot of cases. To protect individuals from being placed under guardianship inappropriately, alternatives to guardianship, such as creating a supported decision-making agreement, should really be explored. And there are a lot of alternatives to guardianship that allow someone to maintain their civil rights while also receiving assistance from somebody else. So we need to really view Brady's conservatorship as a disability rights issue, because it is. For more information on guardianship and disability rights, I recommend watching Jessica Kelgren Fozard's video, which is titled, Why Free Britney is a Disability Rights Issue. And for more information about guardianship and guardianship abuse, I recommend watching John Oliver's Last Week Tonight episode about guardianship. So that's what I have for you today. The case of Britney Spears' conservatorship is a bit confusing and also a bit concerning. You know, we can only hope that Britney is being well taken care of and that her conservatorship is going to be handled how she would like for it to be handled in the future because based on court documents, you know, there's a reason that she doesn't want her father to come back as a conservator, right? Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much if you got to this point in the video. I really appreciate your support. I would love for you to comment down below and like the video and, you know, share it with people. That would be super duper nice of you. Um, you know, if you have questions or thoughts, like I said, put them in the comments. Um, yeah, and I hope you have a wonderful day and bye.